Good evening. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, much better. Well, good evening and welcome to the closing presentation of the Penn College Centennial Colloquia Series. I'm Paul Starkey, I'm Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost here at the college. And I'm very pleased to, um, to have been asked to be the um, Master of Ceremonies tonight to introduce our speaker. Tonight's presentation by Dr. Craig Miller really caps a remarkable year in the renewal, renewal of a Penn College tradition, the presentation of Colloquia. Many thanks to the Centennial Colloquia Committee for their work in organizing the series and the presenters for their lectures. Our faculty and our invited guests have taken the centennial theme, technology and society, and delivered provocatively. Tonight's presenter promises to deliver more of the same. Dr. Craig Miller is Assistant Professor of History and Political Science and the head of the Department of Humanities here at Penn College. He holds the Bachelor of Arts in History from SUNY Geneseo, the Master of Arts and PhD in History from the um, University at Buffalo. Craig came to Penn College in 2011 from his role as Assistant Director of the Consortium on the Niagara Frontier, a nonprofit dedicated to providing post-secondary education in the New York prison system. Since coming to Penn College, he has been very active across campus, particularly in involving our students in thought-provoking ways in uh, a number of activities, including a very popular series of roundtable discussions, where he's um, had topics ranging from the U.S. Constitution to religion, is there a God, to current legal and political policies related to the war on drugs. Uh, Craig's is an interesting story. Prior to his collegiate work, he worked for 10 years as a line cook. He paid for grad school by bartending. So he understands two of the important things in life, He's taught in prisons, written grants to support literacy, and is very active as a Little League umpire. As such, Craig understands choices and the consequences associated with them. And that makes Craig particularly well qualified to prepare and deliver tonight's address focused on technology, power, and, and responsibility. Using the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in the mid-19th century, as his case in point, Craig will show us the impact of choices available in implementing emerging technologies and consequences of such choices. I ask you to join me in welcoming tonight's colloquia speaker, Craig Miller. Good evening, everybody. How you guys doing? All right. I want to start out by thanking some people, uh, since this is the last one of these we're doing. And I wanted to start out by thanking the colloquial committee, who had to take the time to sift through all the proposals, had to organize pre-planning sessions and sit through, uh, I believe, hours of uh, dry runs for these proposals. So I'd like to have a big round of applause, if you don't mind, for the colloquial committee for putting this together. And if I can borrow your hands for one more round of applause, I want to spe give a special thanks to the AV department for having to put together all of these for us, making sure that our audio and visual needs are being met. They've had to sit through hours of these two, and none of these would have been possible without the hard work that they put in. So again, thank you. So the aim of this series has been, during the centennial, to showcase what Penn College has become. From its origins as, as a technical school, to a community college, to what we feel is the future of higher education. The blending of hands-on training required in the modern work world with the core components of a liberal arts education designed to expand our students' minds as well as their job opportunities. We're not preparing our students for the future, we're preparing our students to shape the future. And our series has illustrated this through the diverse presenters we've seen. On the more tangible, hands-on side, Rob Wozniak and Dorothy Gehring and their students showed us how Penn College students are at the forefront of developing more ecologically and economically stable housing. Lisa Bach pr uh, prodded us to think more broadly about what privacy means in an age where the technologies designed to protect our privacy are beginning to cross the threshold from the digital or between the digital and the biological. 
Our guest speaker, uh, Jaron Lanier, challenged us to question our personal relationship to technology. And for those of you who are here, provided us with a little bit of musical relief at the end. But we've also showcased our commitment to and our pride in our liberal arts curriculum. Rob Cooley and Mark Noy waxed poetically about the relationship between physical space and the language we try to use to express our relationships to that space. Our guest speaker, Alan Lightman, suggested that we remain cognizant of the opportunity costs associated with our technological obsessions and encouraged a more balanced approach that keeps a keen focus on one of the last refuges of private space, the mind. So tonight, I want to conclude the Centennial Series by continuing the theme of the value of a liberal arts curriculum. And the subject tonight is the exploration of the costs and the consequences of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. But my goal tonight is to re encourage reflex reflexive critical analysis about technology. As I often tell students in my history classes, I'm not here to teach you history. I'm here to use history to teach you to become better critical thinkers. But I also want to put a little bit of a burden on all of you tonight. You all have a special responsibility as educated people. You're members of what I'm going to call the political class. Now, you don't need a college education to become a member, but those of you with college education are members whether you want to be or not. Because the political class are the members of society who shape decision-making processes, decision-making processes that affect every single one of us. And I'm not talking about voting, although voting is a component. Members of the political class shape, I lost my spot. This never happens in class. <laughs> members of the political class shape the choices and thus the consequences of political, cultural, and economic spheres. You become a member of this class by becoming a critical thinker, by learning to evaluate information in a logical, methodical, rational, and holistic manner. You shape this future through your choices, what you buy, where you work, what you read, and obviously how you vote. And all of these activities play a role in the direction our communities and our nation proceed in. And I humbly submit to you tonight that the study of history is really well suited to help develop these skills. So for a second here, I want to talk a little bit about history. I think the best way to think about history, the study of the past, is to think about it as a conversation. History, or the study of history, is a conversation between the past and the present. And it's a conversation that's almost always about the future. We interrogate the past to learn lessons, to find clues, to see what past actors couldn't see in order to learn from both their successes and their failures. And this unique, and I think in some ways ironic conversation, or at least the ironic aspect of this conversation, is that it's constantly changing. I have students, uh, usually students who are less than enthused about the fact that they have to take a world history course in which I get to cover 75,000 years of human history in 15 weeks. <laughs> but a lot of them ask me, why are we still doing this? Don't we know everything that there is to know? How can we possibly, after studying history for centuries, find anything new? And I love it when they ask this question because it's a perfect segue, particularly on the first day of the class. Because what I explain, or my rationale is that the past is about the present, and the present's always changing. And because the present's always changing, we look to the past for different things at different times. Think of the past like an endless library of information and lessons suited to almost any contemporary dilemma. The challenge for us is to learn how to interrogate the past properly. And the most important facet, the most effective way to interrogate the past is to be able to appreciate context and multiple perspectives both of which require taking time. Now, Dr. Lightman, for those of you who are here for his talk, noted uh, that we rarely seem in the modern world to see the value in slowing down, that speed is of the utmost importance in our world. And I chuckled to myself when I said it because I knew he was right. And yet, as a historian who was going to come before you and talk about the building of the railroads, I knew that 
that obsession, that modern obsession with speed, wasn't all that modern. As we're going to see, the railroads evinced a 19th century narrative of speed, or 19th century narrative, excuse me, that was steeped in progress and speed, industrial speed. To appreciate the consequences of that narrative, however, we need to learn to slow down. To appreciate the impact of the railroads requires a full appreciation of the context in which they were built. The people involved in the construction, the planning, the finance, but perhaps most importantly, the costs and the benefits. We need to try to understand the railroads in ways 19th century observers couldn't which requires trying to appreciate as many perspectives as possible, all of which, as I said, requires time and patience. Tonight, you only have to be patient for about another 35 minutes. One last thing before I get to the railroads, as I would like to read you guys a quote that I would like you to keep in mind for the rest of this talk. The quote is from a Russian author named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago. Any of you read The Gulag Archipelago? A few intrepid souls? Solzhenitsyn was a Russian dissident who spent six years in a Soviet gulag, which is a prison, where he experienced forced labor, torture, and starvation. All of this because he was a dissident, because he opposed what the Soviets were doing. And once he was released, he wrote a book and in this book, he had the following to say about the processes that led the Stalin regime to power. He said, quote, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And I want to read that one more time so you keep this in your mind through the rest of the talk. If only there were evil people somewhere, insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Solzhenitsyn, in this quote, is describing what a graduate school colleague of mine dubbed the Miller Maxim. I was constantly fond of saying to him and anybody else who brought me with a problem, choices have consequences. Despite suffering at the hands of one of the most murderous regimes in human history, Solzhenitsyn refused to believe that people were simply born evil. Human beings make choices, and those choices have consequences. And thus, the more informed our choices are, the more readily we can assess the potential consequences of those choices. Now, the United States has been a relatively stable and prosperous society for much of its existence. And you could argue that this stability and prosperity has increased over the past half century, despite our recent economic downturn. And to plug the college a little bit more, I think it's fair to say that higher education has played and plays a significant role in creating and maintaining a stable and prosperous society. People still come to the United States from all over the world to gain access to our higher education system because they see it as a key component in emulating our successes. Part of this success is that a representative republic like ours requires an informed citizenry, with citizens capable of critical thinking, with people more interested in knowledge than ideology. And to be able to tell the difference between those two things is the essence of critical thinking. Which brings me to the railroads. As I noted, we need to appreciate context. Right? And the foundation for the building of the transcontinental railroads was laid during and immediately after the United States Civil War in the 1860s. For Northerners, uh, particularly industrial capitalists and moderate Republicans, the railroads were the logical product of the Civil War because they represented both the values and the desires that motivated the Union to use war to settle the secession crisis of 1861. Now, it's indisputable that slavery was the motivating factor for both North and South in the outbreak of war. 
But the opposition to and defenses of slavery took many forms and were predicated on many different values and different desires. In the South, slavery represented an economic system and a social and political system, all of which were wrapped up in the basic denial of human rights to blacks. But those rights were denied for different reasons. Economically speaking, slaves were denied the rights to negotiate a wage, to negotiate for their work conditions, to have any kind of job portability. But their social and political rights were denied to maintain a feudal-like social system as well as a feudal economic system that was built upon racial hierarchies. In fact, many historians have surmised that one of the reasons that so many non-slave-owning whites fought for the South during the Civil War wasn't because they thought that if they won, someday they'd own slaves. It was because that slaves were lower than poor whites were on the social system in the South, and they didn't want to see that change. In the North, opposition to slavery was a cannibalistic, many-headed hydra. Some Northerners opposed slavery on moral grounds, from abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and his newsletter, The Liberator, to John Brown's promotion of violent revolution to overthrow slavery, to the space in between occupied by the Underground Railroad. How many of you have heard of the Underground Railroad before? Any of you guys ever heard of Henry Box Brown? Some of my students should be raising their hands or they're going to have uh, <laughs> some problems with me in the morning. Henry Box Brown is one of my heroes. Henry Box Brown, with the help of the Underground Railroad, mailed himself from here to here. He had, with help of the Underground Railroad, people built him a box, put him inside of that box, and mailed that box to a free state. He spent 37 hours in the box, probably about eight and a half to 10 of those hours hanging upside down, which can kill you. He survived. But the moral opposition to slavery in the North was fervent, but it wasn't widespread. Most Northerners opposed slavery on economic grounds, not on grounds of equality, particularly political or social equality. Most Northerners saw slavery as an impediment to economic growth. The industrial capitalist system that was emerging in the United States, in the northern United States in particular, was predicated on wage labor. Mass production, the kind of mass production that industrialization produced, requires motivated labor. And wages are highly motivating for people who don't own property and have to buy many of life's necessities. Slaves stood in glaring opposition to this doctrine. Economically speaking, think of slaves like serfs. They are bound to the land they work, although European serfs weren't bought and sold as frequently. But serfdom and slavery essentially was a system that predicated on you worked and you got room and board and medical care, and that was it. What this means is that to a serf or a slave, whatever commodity you are growing, the price of it is meaningless to you. Price means nothing to you if you are a serf, and particularly if you're a slave, because you are paid in food and shelter. If the price of cotton is $100 a bushel one season and $50, bushels, $50 a bushel the next season, you're not getting more food or less food. You're not getting more shelter or less shelter. Add to this that agricultural commodities cannot be grown faster. Right? There's very little a worker can do to coax cotton to come out of the ground with any more speed. So to a wage laborer, the relationship, or I should say, on the flip side, to a wage laborer, the relationship between price and production is much more relevant, and thus the incentive to work harder is greater. And so many Northerners believed that non-free labor had no motivation, or the workers had no motivation, and therefore, they cannot industrialize. They cannot keep up with the rapid pace of speed that was brought on by industrialization. And to give you an example of this, in the 1860s, while the United States is fighting a civil war, killing 600,000 of ourselves over this issue of slavery, the Russian czar, Nicholas II, decided that in order to build the Trans-Siberian Railroad, they had to voluntarily free all their serfs to create a mobile workforce. Now, they're not granting them many political or social rights, but the Americans weren't the only people to recognize or perceive that serfdom or slavery stood in the way of industrialization. 
this anti-slavery movement in the United States, which was distinct from the abolitionist movement that had a moral opposition to slavery, saw slavery as an antiquated impediment to industrial growth. And thus, extending political and social rights to former slaves took a backseat to investment in industry, and in particular, investment in the railroads. And anyone with a passing knowledge of the period immediately after the Civil War called Reconstruction knows that political and civil rights for blacks were very short-lived. In fact, the new economic system that came to dominate the South after the Civil War called sharecropping was little more than debt slavery. Have any of you ever heard of sharecropping before? Again, my students should be raising their hands. Right. So the sharecropping system, for those of you who don't know, works like this. Imagine for a second that there's probably like four people up there. It's perfect. All of you up there are slave owners, but you've lost all your slaves. It's post-Civil War. The rest of you are slaves, but you've been freed. Congratulations. So what do you do with your newfound freedom? You probably need to get a job at some point. Very few of you are going to be taking all the money you made in slavery and taking European vacations or trips to Hawaii. You need work. And what skills do you have? Most of you probably know something about farming. You know anybody who's looking for farm work? They're looking for farm work. And now the system has changed to such that they need to pay you for your labor, but there is no Department of Labor to protect your wages. There's no such thing as a minimum wage. There's no OSHA. There is nothing. There are people up there who own all of the land and say to you, here's what we'll do. I'll break up my land into plots, and I'll give you and your family a plot of land. You work it, and we split the profits. Sounds like a reasonable deal, doesn't it? Any of you have any tools? What about seed? Because they won't rent land to anybody who doesn't have tools or seed. So what do you do? The nice people up there tell you, I'll tell you what. I'll lend them to you at interest. And we'll take that out of your portion. So what was 50-50 is now 70-30 in their favor. Now imagine that during the Civil War, right, the primary product that Southern slaves before the Civil War were growing was cotton. That cotton production ceases during the Civil War, almost completely. Do you think the European producers of textiles who bought that cotton decided to just sit on their hands and wait it out, see who won the war? If you're a producer of a commodity and your access to that commodity is limited, you have to go find someplace else to get it. So while the Civil War is going on, the British and other European countries step up their cotton production in places like India and Egypt so that by the time American cotton gets back on the market, the supply has dramatically increased. Any of you students with a passing knowledge of economics know what's going to happen when you add lots and lots and lots and lots of supply? Your price is going to go down. Add to this that lots of places in the South experienced droughts, which cut into production, which essentially meant that the sharecropping system that emerged after the Civil War was a new form of slavery. It was debt slavery that most slaves could not get out of. And yet, Northern Republicans who had championed the cause of the Civil War argued that, well, nobody's forcing them. That's free labor. And it was this vision of an industrial society built on free labor right, that pushed Northern industrialists to try to deliver on this promise of free labor through the railroads. And many of those former slaves who saw sharecropping for what it was decided and were lured by the promise of free labor on the railroads. But we'll get back to them in a second. The other important piece of this contextual puzzle is westward expansion. If there was one consistency amongst all Europeans, including the English settlers who came to North America, it was their desire for land and their sense of entitlement to it. To European settlers, to the English in particular, the Americas represented an untapped paradise, free for the taking. Europeans rationalized dispossessing native peoples by first arguing they weren't economically civilized. They still hunted and gathered, although many Indians still farmed. Europeans conveniently ignored that. 
And because they still hunted and gathered, many European settlers argued that Indians were not very far removed from, quote unquote, the beasts that roam the land. Keeping in mind that most of this expansion happened in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, this is a time in which Europeans could easily, and from their perspective, rightly argue that since Indians were polytheists, people who believed in multiple gods, they couldn't have legal title to their land because legal titles to land in Christian and Islamic societies were derived through God, not from gods. In retrospect, I think, the globalizing and liberalizing of markets is what was driving the desire for land. Right? The fact or the argument that Indians were economically uncivilized or weren't practicing the right religion, I think were rationalizations in many ways. Europe, at the time Europeans migrated to the Americas, Europe was coming out of a period of relative economic stagnation. For hundreds of years after the fall of the Roman Empire, most trade in Europe was local. Right? This was produced by a lack of security. The lack of security came from a lack of stable political institutions. And both of these things perpetuated a very stagnant economy that lasted for centuries. But once Europeans started to stabilize their economic systems through social reforms, one of which the ending of serfdom, they created market conditions and there was a demand for access to new markets. And the Americas represented an impossible promise of unchecked expansion. The more global trade opened, the more opportunities there were for people to participate. And this period of exploration and development led to the creation of the society you are living in today, one of the freest, most dynamic societies in human history. But it was also a period of naked conquest that was rationalized under a mantra of progress. As I tell my students, history is rarely easy or simple. Now, the railroads that were to cut through the land claims by both the United States and Native peoples after the inception of the United States in 1789 and since the beginning of our founding, the goal of federal Indian policy, and Indians played a prominent role in the uh, speeches and policies of early presidents, but the pro predominant and overarching goal of federal policy was to assimilate Indians, to make them Christian farmers who could sell off excess hunting lands at a discount to American settlers and companies. In fact, I think our first president, George Washington, summed this policy up best. In his first inaugural address, dealing with the subject of Indians, he noted that, quote, Indians would either assimilate or continue to be pushed west until they became extinct like wolves. It's a sobering assessment, especially for our modern ears, right? But this was the more enlightened view, right? Most Americans at the founding, or many Americans at the founding, argued essentially that Indians only had those two choices. They had to either start living like we lived or they had to be moved west. And that's what you see in this uh, map up here. This is one of the first major attempts at uh, removing Indians to the west. This has the blue line up there as the infamous Trail of Tears. And the pacification of western tribes, these tribes here that led to the building of the railroads, sped this process of either assimilation or removal up. By the end of the reconstruction period in the 1870s, the federal government had begun trying to lure Indians like these onto reservations with the promises of treaty rights and guaranteed land rights and the treaties used phrases like this land will be yours as long as the grass shall grow or as long as the river shall run. And one of the things I want you to keep in mind is that all of these groups here were hunting and gathering groups, which meant that they ranged and roamed over the land, all the land that you see here. The federal Indian policy did this. Right? So all those dark orange spaces you see there are the reservations that native people were combined or confined to. We're talking about the loss of over 100 million acres of land. One of the problems for the American government was that this first step of the reservations ended up, it's the easiest way to put this, they were so poorly designed 
that eventually the government was going to argue that they needed even more of that land that you see up there. The first president elected after the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant, had committed the United States to what he called a peace policy. And this policy promised westward expansion so that the United States could not only do this, excuse me, but do this. My slides got out of order. And the reason Grant promoted this peace policy of expansion without war was because the United States was, as he put it, very war-weary after a civil war in which Americans had killed 600,000 of each other. So because Grant committed to not fighting wars, the United States then went on to fight a non-war war against Indians for 20 more years. The problem with this is that Grant was trying to convince himself to convince the Congress and to convince the American people that they weren't fighting a war and that any hostilities that broke out weren't their fault. We wanted peace. Our policy is called a peace policy. If Indians are unwilling to accept what we're offering them, it's not our fault that they won't accept it. This peace policy of Grant's witnessed bloody bloody battles, (laughs) uh, including the infamous Custer's Last Stand. But the United States Army had a difficult time pacifying many Indians and forcing them onto reservations because the native people in the Southwest and the Plains in particular had been raising and training horses for hundreds of years before the Army showed up. And so the United States Army decided to launch a campaign of attrition. If they couldn't force Indians onto the reservations militarily, then they would starve them and force them to go to the reservations where there was the only available food. And what you see up here is the product of this attrition war. That man is standing on top of a pile of buffalo skulls. For those of you who can't see it in the back. The United States Army encouraged settlers trekking west, encouraged soldiers to shoot buffalo, discard the meat, keep the hides if you wanted it, but the skulls you could get paid for, and all these skulls you see here were gonna be ground up and used as fertilizer. But as I said, this The reservations designed proved to be too small. The reservations, excuse me, I lost my place again. Um, Rail companies who had started petitioning the government in the 1860s to build a transcontinental railroad were trying to maximize their value by laying as much track as possible, as quickly as possible, often petitioning the government to grant rights of access through existing reservation land. Right. You can add to this that in the Sioux Reservation in South Dakota, up here, gold was discovered in the Black Hills mines, and many railroad pioneers wanted to see trains built into those mines to expedite the flow of gold out. To make room for the railroads, the government instituted a new policy called the Dawes Act. The official name of the act was the General Allotment Act, but the senator who put it together, who some of you may have seen his picture during the uh, pre-photos. Dawes argued that the way in which to both make room for the railroads and benefit Indians at the same time was to take the reservation lands and divide them up give each individual Indian male, head of family, 160 acres for him and his family, give them seed, give them tools, send out Christian missionaries to teach them how to farm and become Christian, and whatever excess land was left over could be sold to the railroads. In fact, most of it was just given to the railroads. One of the problems with this policy is it again repeats policies that had been attempted before. When I teach Native American history uh, here at the college, my students are often scratching their heads by the fourth and fifth week of their class thinking that, is he giving the same lecture over and over again? Are we reading the same thing? Because the policy was essentially, offer them civilization, if they won't take it, move them. Offer them civilization, if they won't take it, move them. But when you get to the Pacific Ocean and there's no place left to move them, what do you do? But I don't want to single out Grant's peace policy or Dawes Allotment Act because every single president, every politician that came before both of them, 
right, promoted an Indian policy that was predicated on assimilation, on making Indians white. The problem for Grant and Dawes, and for those who preceded them, was that they did not possess the ability or the willingness to see the situation through Indian eyes. It was inconceivable to men like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Grant and Dawes that anyone would prefer a native life lifestyle to that of quote unquote civilized Christians. It was this inability to perceive Indian perspectives that ended up rationalizing the use of violence when Indians resisted that rationalized intimidation, that rationalized forced assimilation. Again, all of this is stemming from an inability to appreciate, at least and stemming in part, from an ability to appreciate native perspectives. Lest I spend the entire night depressing you, the railroads were a monumental achievement. Perhaps first and foremost, um, the Transcontinental Railroad is one of the first industrial projects in human history to be built with almost completely free labor. And that in and of itself was a monumental achievement. Now granted, the conditions for the workers you see here, like Chinese workers, black work gangs, uh, were certainly nowhere near what we would like for modern standards, and even by contemporary standards, the work conditions were terrible. But the vast majority of people who worked the railroad made a choice to do so, and northern industrialists and moderate Republicans championed this at every, t every step they could. The railroads also illustrated some of the best, also some of the worst, aspects of industrial capitalism. Nothing was more important to the industrial West uh, than the building of the railroads, or at least so the people who built them argued. Uh, in 1862, the same year the Congress passed the Homestead Act, which provided free Western land to anyone who wanted to settle, the Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Bill. This bill provided large monetary loans at very favorable rates, along with generous grants of lands to two railroad companies, the Union Pacific working east to west and the Central Pacific working west to east in order to build this transcontinental railroad. Once the government aid was secured, the owners of the companies took to the private investment market where the government-backed financing they'd already received spurred millions of dollars in bonds, in investment in bonds and stock. Now keep in mind, all of this is happening before a single track has been laid. The government has granted the money out, the companies have taken that grant money and shopped it around to investors saying, hey, look at all the money the government's giving us, this means we're gonna make some profit. Those people then invest their money into the railroads. Two years later, with surveying still going on, Congress, at the prodding of the railroad companies, passed another bill that provided an additional monetary subsidy for every mile of track laid. The point of this was to infuse liquidity into a market that still had no customers. And it is this desire to get this liquidity in that leads to the uh, rapid pace of development, which is one of the things that pushed these developers to build into existing Indian reservations. Because if you're building a railroad track, can you guys see this little dot up here? Right, so if you need to get from here to here, this is an easy way to do it, but if you're getting paid for every mile of track you lay, why not do it like this? And this is what leads these railroad companies to design track routes that went into Indian reservations. But there's no question that once the railroads were completed, they represented and facilitated growth and development. Keep in mind, for example, that the typical journey from New York to San Francisco over land before the railroads would probably take you around three, maybe a little longer than three months. By sea could take you a little bit quicker, but there were a lot more risks at sea, and you had to take a much more circuitous route. There was no Panama Canal. You had to go all the way around South America. For a modern analogy, right, to think about how we could increase speed and transportation in the modern world, how long does it take to get something from Amazon? Can you get it two days, one day? So the modern analogy to this would be you could order something from Amazon and have it in less than two hours. The railroads were truly a technological marvel. And once the funding was secured, once the investment began, once the Companies began being paid for the miles of track they laid. 
the Herculean task of organizing the labor and materials for the rail began. And this again is another monumental achievement of the railroads because aspects of the construction of these railroads could require organizing as many 20, as, as 20,000 workers at a time and keeping track of all the hours they worked. Time was of the essence, both figuratively and literally. In fact, one of the first reported incidents which brought about a change in time in North America was related to the railroads. In August of 1853, two trains heading towards each other on the same track in New England collided as the train guards had different times set on their watches. Now, as comical as it sounds, and we can probably laugh now because it was you know, over 150 years ago and that's my cutoff, you can laugh at things that are over 150 years old. But 14 people died. Imagine the time issues that are going to be involved in railroad tracks that cross the entire country rather than just cross New England. In fact, the time zones that we use in North America now are the product of the necessity of having synchronized train schedules. Time, as I've already said, was of the essence for the rail companies too. And the government encouraged rapid construction by not offering, only offering the subsidies for the tracks laid, but the federal government started offering exclusive contract rights to particular com commercial shipping as the railroads went on through the 1860s and 1870s. The ideology of progress is stimulating the demand for the railroad, much more so than any physical, tangible demand for anything else. Unfortunately, corruption surrounded the construction of the railroads too. Despite millions in government subsidies, the Union Pacific faced bankruptcy less than three years after the last spike was laid, as details of a scandal from a subcontractor that had overcharged the Union Pacific. And this is one of my favorite capitalism and marriage of government and capitalism stories. Thomas Clark Durant, this handsome fellow, was the owner of the Union Pacific, came up with a scheme to have a subcontractor do the actual work. So he had a Union Pacific company that did the surveying, surveyed the, uh, did the surveying, secured the funding, right, dealt with the investment, but then hired a subcontracting company to actually build the tracks. After he hired that company, he bought that company and then started charging twice the regular amount for the type of work to be done. Well, think about this for a second. Durant approaches the government and says, I need money to build a railroad. The government says, fine, here's money to build a railroad. He then takes that money and goes to the private investment market and says, hey, I'm building a railroad with government money. Invest away. The investors bring in their money. He then, using money from the government and investors, hires a subcontracting company owned by him that he then buys and uses that company to overcharge himself. But he's not really overcharging himself, he's overcharging the federal government. But none of this, these scandals came out until after the last spike had been laid. But uh, I believe, and I can't remember the name of the gentleman who bought it, uh, but the Union Pacific was then bought off of or bought from Durant at a very, very low price. But the railroad still did usher in an era of transcontinental trade and travel. Despite the fact that they were replaced by automotive transport in the early 20th century, I think it can be reasonably argued that the railroads, despite the negatives, did help the United States become a global economic power. But we've also talked about the negatives. And I think one of the most important negatives, not the only, one of the most important negatives, was the fact that the railroads set a precedent for a racially segregated workforce that lasted more than a century after the Civil War. Right? Over 100 years. The first major example of this new free workforce had black work gangs and Chinese work gangs and Irish work gangs and German work gangs. And this economic consequence bled into society. If people can't work together, why should they have to live near one another? Why should they have to send their children to the same schools? The other major enduring legacy, as we've already talked about, was the displacement and the subsequent attempt of the ethnic cleansing of Native American tribes. The sad thing about this, well, one of the sad things about this, was that the policy makers involved in the attempts to civilize Indians, people like Dawes and Grant, they believed that Indian culture stood in the way of progress. The tragic part about this is for the 19th century, that was the enlightened view. 
The view of most Americans were that Native Americans were biologically inferior, that there was nothing you could do to change them. And if there's nothing you can do to change somebody who is in the way of your progress, it's very easy to start seeing them as the enemy and rationalizing new ways to dispossess them. Now, I don't think it's fair, and I've had this debate with many historians and many Native Americans that I know too, I don't think it's reasonable to call what transpired in the West genocide. But I think it's a clear example of what's called ethnic cleansing. And it's not a word we generally use to associate with our own country. But let me read you the definition uh, that the United Nations uses for ethnic cleansing, and you can make up your minds for yourselves. Ethnic cleansing, according to the United Nations, is the systematic forced removal of an ethnic or religious group from a given territory with the intent of making that territory ethnically or religiously homogenous. The forces applied may be various forms of forced migration, deportation, population transfer, as well as mass murder and, and intimidation. I think it's a fair description. Much of this happened because of a narrative that was supported not by demand, but by a very blinding commitment to ideology. And that ideology was called Manifest Destiny. How many of you have heard of Manifest Destiny before? Excellent. Now I should ask somebody to define it. Since I'm the one up here, I guess I'll take the responsibility. Manifest destiny was the belief of most, or at least many 19th century Americans that God preordained the United States to control the country from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. This mass manifest destiny was supported by a belief that American society, and by American society I mean a Christian, industrial, capitalist, democratic society, was the way God intended people to live. Because very few people question this, few people question denying political and social rights to blacks, or the ethnic cleansing of Indians who were not living God's clearly intended lifestyle. Instead, this ideology praised progress. And progress moved forward at a billowing pace in a world where machines began to do the work of men and beasts. But again, I'm not here tonight to condemn the building of the railroads. I'm not here to condemn the United States. Far from it. As I've already said, I think we live in one of the freest, most dynamic societies that has ever existed. And I'm proud to be part of this fantastic, if sometimes flawed, experiment. But the freedom and dynamism that we The freedom and dynamism that we possess is not self-effectuating. It requires vigilance and knowledge and critical thinking. As Solzhenitsyn said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. I believe that line is critical thinking. I believe that being willing to accept uncomfortable truths and learn from them is the key to maintaining a free, dynamic society. And so tonight, I'm putting this responsibility on all of you. Our society needs critically-minded citizens. And at heart, this is the core of the mission of this college. It's your job to remain vigilant, to think for yourselves, to make up your own minds based on logical, critical analysis. It's the job of the college to help you develop those skills. Because living a fulfilled life is not just about success in your career. Right? It requires vigilance in the face of ideology, the pursuit of knowledge, and the willingness to question our own assumptions, particularly those about the nature of technological progress. So lest I simply diagnose the problem without entertaining solutions, I'd like to pose a modern, if imperfect, analog to the railroads. Drones. You guys know what drones are? All right. Drones, I think, are the quintessential modern technology. They can be used to make both art and war. They are relatively inexpensive and thus accessible, read democratic, but the way in which we've used drones balances the scales or runs the gamut of the, the spectrum. Military and intelligence services use of drones has drawn scrutiny, 
but I think that scrutiny faded away after a recent political campaign in which both candidates supported the use of drones and a majority of the press stopped asking questions. As a historian, as a historian who spends a great deal of time studying military history, you should always be wary of anyone who promises you that they have a technology designed to minimize the military threat posed to your side. The choice often has dire unintended consequences. But drones also have private sector uses, some of which are breathtaking. I had a student in my office last week showing me aerial and uh, photography and videography he took of the campus with a drone, and it was breathtaking. And drones might have come to have an application in private and public sector transportation innovation. As some of you probably know, Amazon is considering making my two-hour delivery a reality by using drones to deliver packages. So maybe it's right around the corner. But, like with the railroads, we need to be mindful and willing to challenge our own notions of progress in order to make the most informed choices possible. We need to ask questions. Questions like, what particular demand is two-hour delivery satisfying? And what are the costs, or what might the costs, of satisfying that demand be? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, by definition, a colloquia invites, uh, invites questions. So, have you questions? We have one here in the middle. How do you feel about the um, American tradition of Thanksgiving? That's a good question. Um, Thanksgiving, I think, in many ways represents a little bit of historical amnesia. Um, uh, cutting both ways, the Thanksgiving celebration that is celebrated is a pretty impressive event considering how American history turned out. Because that event is between Plymouth settlers and Wampanoag Indians. And the Wampanoag Indians formed a mutual defense pact, an alliance that lasted with those colonists for 70 years. So looking backwards from that point, to the, from the colonists' perspective and from the native people's perspective, or at least the Wampanoag's perspective, that period represented something positive. But it fell apart relatively quicker after, the, particularly the Indian leader, um, Massasoit, who had formed that alliance, died. And so I think for many native people looking backwards, it's easy to say, well, yeah, it's nice to remember that little time when things, when things were going well. But then there were like these other four centuries where you screwed us, and that's what we tend to focus on. Um, and so, I mean, I tell my students, if you want to be real traditional Thanksgiving, the way to celebrate it is to break into a native person's house on Thanksgiving and take all of their food and eat it and kick them out of their house. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm hoping nobody takes me up on that advice. But it doesn't, I don't think, I think we have to remember the past in its totality. Right? And I think particularly what Thanksgiving means to me is that, that promise of what was possible and to think about how and why it fell apart. Other questions? We have one. One of my students, uh, at Davron, the faculty, one of my students brought to my attention a YouTube video, Humans Need Not Apply. I'm wondering if you should put, you're nodding your head, you've seen it. it. Okay, uh, could you comment on that because it has some prior dire predictions? <laughs> you're talking about the, the, the fact that human labor is gonna become obsolete. Yeah, I don't buy it. Um, if you think about that one of the futures of technology is massive computing, right? That computers are becoming these massive sources of information for almost everything that we do. But the computers can't go out and get the information themselves. Somebody has to put that information into the system to make it available. And so at some level, I think, regardless of what kind of technology you create, human beings are going to be involved in the process of doing it. The aspects of that process might be different. We might have completely mechanized construction and production. But I still think in terms of design, I still think in terms of deciding which information is relevant and which information isn't relevant, human beings are always gonna be able to do that better than machines. That's just my interpretation. I think we have to be prepared for technology altering the way in we, which we live. But I find it, and maybe I'm just a, a dinosaur, 
but I find it hard to imagine this kind of technological revolution being such that human beings essentially, I mean, have any of you seen the movie Idiocracy? Where human beings basically just sit around and drink Gatorade, and that's the extent of their lives. Um, so I think that, to make a long answer short, I think no, I, I don't think, I think jobs are going to shift. I think the demands of the work world are going to shift, but I don't think that humans are going to be completely 86 out of that process, or even in a, in a very significant way. I mean, people made the same arguments about the Industrial Revolution, right? The Luddites who started smashing British factory equipment argued that this is the end of our workforce. This is the end of human labor as it exists, and 150 years later, we're still here talking about it. We have a question over here. Were there any other forces of change that led to the same degree of centralized wealth and power in American history as the railroads? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yes, but I don't know what they are. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm stalling for time while my brain processes all the information because unlike a computer, I can't process it fast enough. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to look at westward expansion as being centralized because it's initially being driven by the states, not the federal government. And so the powers aren't as centralized. Um, but when you, I think the railroads are really the first good example of this because throughout the 19th century, and in some ways maybe we're recycling back, the heat, most heated political debates were about spending money for infrastructure, about building roads and building highways and building canals. In fact, Andrew Jackson, when he was president, vetoed more bills than any other president before him combined, and the vast majority of those were transportation-related bills because Jackson's argument was that if states want to build a road to connect them, then let those states do it. Why should New York pay for a road in South Carolina or Virginia pay for a road that's going to lead out to the Northwest Territory? Um, but I think the railroads are really the first good example of this. I think the second big example of this is when the United States gets more involved on the global scale, you start to see the rise of what Eisenhower called that military-industrial complex. And I think that was also an effort to protect trade. I mean, you look at things like the Spanish-American War, um, the extended war in the Philippines, those things were about markets. In many ways, you could argue that many of our wars are essentially about markets at core. But it's not really until the federal government is the institution that is backing that kind of expansion that you start to see real centralization of power like that. And I think in some ways that's what the Civil War was over too. I think many people in the South were comfortable with a localized centralization of power, very parochial. And that what was being pushed on them, what many people in the South perceived being pushed on them by the North, was this centralized industrial partnership with government that could dictate tariffs, could dictate working conditions. And I think that was as much as the fear of the end of slavery, what those Southerners were responding to. But I think all of the instances which you're referring to are post-building of the railroads. Because the, the, the United States, it's hard to really explain uh, without taking one of my courses. But the United States isn't really a unified, I mean, the Civil War is in many ways a rehash, not necessarily of the American Revolution, but a definition of what it means to be a nation, right? Because, I mean, when the United States is founded, how do you found a country when half the people think it's perfectly fine to enslave another human being and deny them political and social rights, breed them, and take the products of that breeding and sell them off somewhere else, and the other half of the country thinks that's a problem? How do you create a government that governs all of those people? And I think the debate up until the building of the railroads and the Civil War was between centralization and regionalization and localization, and I think the Civil War pretty much settles that debate. There's a question right over here. I thought your uh, comparison between the railroad and the Amazon thing was pretty interesting. We live in a world already where it's, everyone's used to instant gratification and things like that, so what do you see being the um, the cost of something like that, where you have something that you want within two hours? With drones, one of the things I think about is where are they gonna fly over? Where the, they're clearly not gonna be able to fly in commercial airspace, and you wouldn't, I don't think, want them to be. I mean, I'm not an aviation expert, but I can't imagine you would want them flying that, that same height, or the same altitude that um, commercial jet lights fly, but how many of you would want to see drones buzzing over? I mean, think about it. Think about how many things get placed, orders get placed on Amazon every day, right? Hundreds of thousands? That's going to require lots of drones going back and forth. Raise your hand if you want that going over your neighborhood. So which neighborhoods do you think they're going to go through? 
the neighborhoods of the people who aren't politically active, the lower socioeconomic status, people who do not have the lobbying power to say, I don't want those in my neighborhood, that's where they're going to fly through, or probably fly through. The other thing to think about is, how is that going to transform the um, environment? Right? You're adding a new pollutant, if you will, unless the drones are running on completely, if, if they're electric drones, maybe this is not so much of an issue. The aesthetic could be the issue, how it impacts lower uh, income communities. And then just the question of what it does to us as a people. Right? How many of you have had that instant where you're like click on a web page and you're like, well, come on, let's go. Like a few seconds have gone by and you're starting to get tense that you haven't gotten what you've gotten at. I think there's a social and cultural cost to that too, and that we tend to want and demand access to immediate information, and immediate information is rarely correct. Right? You need context and perspective. I mean, I think one of the things that frustrates a lot of the younger, your generation, is I have students constantly tell me they don't engage in politics because there's so many different sources out there, they have no idea who's telling the truth, so they just read none of them and choose not to vote. And I empathize. But I think part of that is a product of this instantaneous demand for things, rather than, I mean, when I was in graduate school writing my dissertation, uh, before graduate school and undergrad, I couldn't contact my professors via email. Email was around, I'm not that old. But very few people were using it yet, so I'd have to sit outside his office for two hours. And I'd sit outside his office two hours and read, or think, or do something else, right, with my time. Uh, and a side note, I had a graduate school professor, and this is one of the things that made me want to get tenure at one point in my life. He had a sign on his door that said, I only respond to emails that require a yes or no answer. I said, yes. That's the life. Any other questions? One right here in the front. Why is it that when we think of the Civil War, we only really think that the only issue that around that time was slavery, but I know it's not really one of the main issues, so why is that? It's a good question, and I think there's a lot of reasons. I think one is because slavery is a massive stain on the history of American society. It's hard to escape it, and because of that, I think in many ways it's easy to think about it in that way. In some ways it makes it a little bit more palatable to think about our history if we think about a war in which 600,000 people died being primarily about liberating oppressed people. Right? Imagine that you are the first generation of Germans born after the Holocaust and after World War II. How do you make sense of your own history? Right? For Americans, one of the ways in which to make sense of that particular part of history was to make it about something that is easy to wrap your head around. Slavery was immoral, and people fought to end that immoral institution. And I'm not saying that people didn't, because lots of them did. But if you look at what happens after the Civil War, it's clear that extending political rights and social rights to former slaves was not of the utmost importance. In fact, many Republicans, and that was the party that was opposed to slavery in the 19th century, started to argue when former slaves started complaining about sharecropping, started literally making arguments like, well, what more do you want from us? You're free, figure it out like the rest of us did. But that's a complicated narrative, right? To understand why it is that people would on the one hand say they wanted to end slavery and extend freedom and equality to people, but have that freedom and equality be limited to the, the economic sphere, that's a more complicated argument to understand. And I think part of the problem for everybody in trying to understand their history is it's easier to simplify things. And I think people have a tendency to gravitate towards arguments that are either this or either that. Right? When you have to explain things in more nuance, you tend to lose people's attention, and I noticed this in my classes. Some of you may be experiencing this right now. But nuance can be boring. But I think it's important sometimes to let ourselves be a little bored because, as you suggest, if we just think of the Civil War as a war that was fought to end the immoral injustice of slavery, it would be very easy to look back and go, well, that didn't work. Right? All it did was end slavery. In fact, there's a book by a historian named Eric Foner who wrote a book called Nothing But Freedom. It's about the ending of slavery in the Caribbean. And he argued that what the ending of slavery in those places did, because it wasn't followed by political and social reform, created a class of people with no capital, no property, no education, and no civic rights. And then argues that well, then people have the nerve to act surprised when those people end up continually at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. If that answers your question. I get an F minus. No, I said I get the F minus. 
No, I don't I think I have the power really to start was, changing your transcript. Oh. <laughs> I guess my question really was, I mean, that's what we mostly know it for, is just knowing it about slavery. So seeing as that's how we, the only reason that we know about the Civil War for the most part until you get in depth into it, have we lost the knowledge of what really happened? Like, because I don't really understand what really happened at that time. I don't, I don't think we've lost it. We're just choosing not to see it. Why is that, though? Why do we not you know? If I had the answer to that question, No, I, I mean, I, and I don't want to just totally dismiss you. I think it's the last thing I was talking about. I think, let me answer it another way. You ever heard of a guy named Edward Bernays? Sigmund Freud's nephew. Freud's nephew ended up working and developing propaganda for the, Amer for the American government before World War I to convince Americans that World War I was in their interests. This is a guy who had made his name by convincing upscale Manhattanites to go see plays that sucked because he would put on the billets, every upscale Manhattanite is gonna be there. And so all the upscale Manhattanites ran out to all these places. Bernays argued that democratic societies were really susceptible, even more susceptible than totalitarian societies, to propaganda. And he said the rationale is, first off, in a totalitarian society, you expect everything that comes from the government to be BS. In a democratic society where everything is free and open, you expect the conversation to be op open and honest. In fact, another 19th century observer of American history, a French guy named Alexis de Tocqueville, argued that the thing he found most interesting about Americans was that they believed that since they lived in a free, open society, only the best ideas would rise to the top. But Bernays argued that essentially, because you live in a, when you live in a democratic, massively populated society, that the, the issues that you have to deal with become so complex that if people can't wrap their heads around them, they disengage, right? How many of you don't vote because you don't have enough information to understand what's going on? And you don't have to raise your hands if you're not comfortable doing it. But I think this is part of the issue. Because the issues are complex, it takes time to wrap your head around them. And in a society where free and open ideas are available, I think people tend to gravitate towards ideas that make sense simplistically. So if I say something like Republicans hate old people and the poor, right, it's not a true statement, but it is a statement that is easier to wrap your head around. Or if I say that, uh, let me say something negative about Democrats. Democrats are all socialists and communists. It may not be true, but it's easy to wrap your head around. And I think the same with, slave, with the Civil War. I think it's easier to wrap your head around the Civil War thinking that it's just about the ending of slavery. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Miller. I'd like to thank Craig for that provocative presentation. Um, as he and our previous presenters have done in other forms, Craig has underscored the need for all of us to understand the link between our choices and um, that are available to us, particularly when it comes to the implementation of technology and the consequences for those choices as we grow in our understanding of the world and our disciplines that we, that we study, so grows our responsibility for the effects of those choices. Thank you for that. While this closes this, um, our, our series of presentations in the colloquia, um, the Centennial Series has one remaining event. The six Penn College faculty who presented this year, and that's Rob Wozniak, Dorothy Gehry, Rob Cooley, Mark Noe, Lisa Bach, and Craig Miller will reconvene as a panel this February um, to discuss the lessons learned from the series. I invite you back for that discussion, and I want to thank you for coming tonight. And I'd like to remind you that as we adjourn, we'll reconvene downstairs in Rapture for some refreshments and to continue this discussion. Again, thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you for coming.